Yeah, Rage Against the Machine. That's what I'm thinking about today. Hello there. This is A.D. Robles, and you're listening to A.D. on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network. Let's get started today. If you are new to my YouTube channel, you should know that I have a podcast on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network. You might know this group as Cross Politic. Cross Politic is a uh, TV show, a video, a YouTube channel, a podcast. They have tons of amazing guests, and they started a podcast network. If you don't know, there is amazing content there. If you if you're if you're looking for non woke Christian content, and I mean really Christian content. This stuff is dripping in scripture, dripping in biblical worldview. You could not do better than the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network, in my humble opinion. Uh, We put out a ton of free content because we want people to have this stuff. But there's also a club. You can support the content by becoming a club member. Use the show code ROBLES, R-O-B-L-E-S, just to let them know that you like this show. Um, And we'll continue to make this content. You'll get access to exclusive content. You'll get access to uh, discounts on gear and all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, I highly recommend it. I'm a little bit biased, of course, because I'm on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network. Um, But every single show, there's shows on business and economics. There's shows on baseball. There's shows on politics. There's shows on uh, feminism and all kinds of different stuff. So I highly recommend it. Please consider joining the Fight, Laugh, Feast Club as a club member. Use the show code ROBLES, R-O-B-L-E-S. Let's get started. Now, if you're new, if you're new to me, uh, this week has been... I, I've Listen, I have, I have a variety of different content that I do. I do content that's intended to be entertaining and funny. Uh, I've done a few of those this week. <laughs> More than normal. Usually it's like half entertaining and half very serious. Um, but... Um, you know, I, everything I talk about is is a serious issue in my opinion. But, you know, I like to have a little bit of cheerfulness. I like to bring a little bit of levity to some of this stuff. Not to, to not to take away from the seriousness of the issues, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of joy in the world as well. And, you know, that's kind of what I'm all about. I'm all about no despair. You might have seen this. No despair in 2020. I actually had the idea for that slogan for 2020 before all the insanity started back in, in January, January 1. And I even sell a No Despair uh, 2020 t-shirt. And I think I couldn't have picked a better year because there is despair all around us. But we have hope, my friends. Christians have hope within us. And we need to be displaying that hope. And so while all the world has gone crazy and all the world is wringing their hands and gnashing their teeth and all of this stuff, we can be beacons of light, if you know what I mean. Because God has given us simple marching orders. He's told us what he requires of us. And he loves us. And he forgives us when we fall short of that. And that is no small thing, my friends. No despair in 2020. No despair. I want to talk about something very serious today. Now, there's a a book in the Bible, I'm sorry, a story in the Bible that, you know, some people have a hard time with, and I I understand it. This is in 2 Samuel chapter 6, and it's the story of Uzzah when God smites him uh, because he touches the ark. If you remember the story, they're bringing the ark uh, back home, and it jostles because it's on a, a cart. The oxen are pulling it on a cart. It kind of jostles because the cart hits a bump. And it looks like the ark is going to fall into the ground. And Uzzah puts his hand out to stop it from falling from the ground. And because he did that, he touches the ark. God strikes him dead. And this angers David very much. This angers King David very much because Uzzah wasn't really, I mean, he had good intentions. He just didn't want the ark to hit the ground. He didn't want the, 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 the beauty and the holiness of God's ark to be damaged by touching the dirt and the mud and, the, and there's probably feces on the ground because these roads, you know, animals were the ones that crossed these roads. And so Uzzah thought he was doing the right thing, but God struck him dead because God had commanded that they were not to touch the ark except in certain ways. He had He had given them exactly what to do when they're moving the ark and all that kind of stuff. And actually, if you really read that story, and by the way, uh, everybody, I think Uzzah went straight to heaven. I I, I think that we're going to meet Uzzah in the new heavens and the new earth. 
And Uzzah was a believer. I don't think he was an unbeliever. He wasn't a degenerate pagan who's just like, oh, I don't care. I'm going to touch the ark. I don't think it was like that. I think his heart was in the right place, sort of, <laughs> you know? Um, but if you really think about it, God was actually judging Uzzah for the whole line of missteps because God told them how they were supposed to carry the ark around. They were supposed to have priests that carried it on their shoulders. They had poles that they would stick into it so they didn't have to touch it, and they would carry the poles on their shoulder, and they weren't doing that. They were carrying it on a cart being pulled by ox or something like that, and because of that, they probably thought it was a good idea because, you know, it was a long way, and the ox are stronger than humans and, and, and all of that. So they probably thought that, you know, they, this was a good way. They were, they were thinking in pragmatic ways. They weren't thinking according to God's law. You see, God told them what to do, and they thought in their minds, yeah, but, you know, this idea would actually get the same job done, and it would be much safer. Uh, and they probably justified it to themselves. They probably said in their minds, yeah, we could probably drop this ark because it's such a long way. Like, this would be safer. This would be better. This would be more official. And we'll carry it on this cart with these oxen. And they did it wrong. It was a pragmatic approach, and it was a wrong approach, and it had a very unintended consequence. The unintended consequence. They, pro they probably thought it was a good idea, but they didn't think ahead. They didn't think ahead. What would happen if the ox went crazy? What happens if the ox stumbles? What happens if, you know, all this stuff, they weren't thinking ahead. And so there was an unintended consequence. Uzzah paid with his life. One of the most amazing things about Christianity uh, and uh, the Bible is that God trained his people all the way from the beginning. He trained his people to be a people that thinks ahead. They think a few steps ahead because you know, when you're living hand to mouth and you're just kind of, let's say you're living in the jungle somewhere and you always have fruit available to you. You just, if you're hungry, you just go to the fruit tree, you grab some fruit. It's always there because it's always growing season. You just live in this uh, uh, tropical paradise. So there's really no reason to plan ahead. There's really no reason to have complicated farming systems and food storage and all that kind of stuff. God, in the middle of all this, he sets a, 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 a whole day apart. This is a day that you worship the Lord and you don't do any work. And so every single week we had to plan ahead. Our people had to plan ahead. They had to prepare things on Friday so that they could rest on the Sabbath, right? On Saturday. So every week God forced his people to start thinking ahead. And then there was also a Sabbath year. And so, so, so God had um, forced his people that there's going to be a year that you're going to need to plan ahead for and stuff like that. And that's an amazing thing because uh, Christians, as they went out into the world, were not only were they very hard workers, everyone's heard of the Protestant work ethic, but they also were very used to thinking ahead, thinking a few steps ahead. And so Christians, I think, part of our legacy, part of our, our worldview, part of the way that we should operate in the world is to be thinking a couple steps ahead, right? And thinking about, you know, some of these unintended consequences that I talked about earlier with Uzzah and the Ark and stuff like that. And the reality is that so often I think we're tempted to not do that. We're tempted to think about the immediate term. We're tempted to think about what pragmatically makes sense. And that is going to have devastating, devastating effects um, on your lives. We need to be very careful to be thinking ahead. Let me tell you what I wanted to talk about today. I was thinking, and this was brought along by uh, a lot of people's social media posts that I saw, people that I know in real life and people otherwise and stuff like that. And these are people that are either currently adoptive parents or planning on becoming adoptive parents of children from Africa, children from uh, Haiti, children from El Salvador, children from Ethiopia, wherever it is, right? Like, like uh, people, places in the third world, you could say. P uh, they adopt children, they're white people, and they adopt children that are, that are brown or black or something like that. And lots of people that I wouldn't expect to be taken up by this woke stuff, by this idea of white privilege, by this idea of uh, white supremacy, by this idea of uh, allyship and anti-racism and all the stuff that I talk about on my channel all day, lots of people that I wouldn't expect are now starting to take up the mantle of these ideologies and they're doing it because they feel like they have a responsibility 
to be this ally since they have a black son or a black daughter or a, uh, a, a brown son or a brown daughter and stuff like that. And I, I just want to really – see how I can put this. I want to plead with you. Think about the unintended consequences of a lot of these teachings because the reality is like I grew up – a minority, right? I grew up a minority and I don't have these woke perspectives of white privilege and the white man's always keeping me down and and I, you know, it's going to be very difficult for me to live my life because of the white man and my dad didn't teach me that stuff. And lots of Puerto Rican dads do teach their kids that stuff. Lots of them do. My dad didn't teach me that stuff. And I've had a fairly successful life, right? But think about all the people that are in the streets rioting right now, looting and, and destroying stuff and, and, and complaining and stuff like that and, and, and saying they don't have enough money, they don't make as much as white people and all that stuff. These people, many of them, have been told all their lives that whites are supreme or at least they act supreme. You see, this whole idea of white supremacy and how, like, blacks can't amount to anything, they won't be able to get ahead unless whites use their privilege to help them. This is a very, very psychologically damaging idea to teach your black kid. You understand what I'm saying? Because if you tell your black son, your adopted black son enough, that whites are always out to get them, whites, uh, whites rule the whole world, all the systems are white systems, every, every power and every privilege it belongs to white people, eventually they're going to believe that. And they're going to think of themselves as a victim, a perpetual victim. And that is not good. For a child to hear from their parents, much less their white parents. Think about the unintended consequences. I know you're not trying to damage your black or brown son. I know this. I know this. But hear it from someone who's lived it. Okay, my dad, my dad told me about racism when I was a kid, right? My dad told me about it. My dad experienced racism. I've told this story before. He, my, my father ran for Congress in, uh, in Connecticut. He ran as a Republican and got trounced. The person he ran against was named Barbara Canelli. You could look it up online. Anyway, so he got trounced. But, but when he announced that his, he was running against Barbara Canelli, someone from our church, a white person from our church, sent him a letter. How dare he run against her? A Democrat sent him a letter. How dare he run against her? You are go back home, this and that. You know, racist letter. You know, my dad experienced racism in, in New York when he lived there. So it's not like he didn't tell me about racism, but here's the reality. He never put this idea in my mind that, that, that whites had this privilege that they didn't earn and that they had all the advantages that I didn't have and all of that stuff. Instead, he said, look, racism's out there, but whether or not it, it comes to you, whether or not someone's racist to you, your responsibility is the same. Before God, your responsibility is the same. My father had very high expectations of me. Very high expectations of me. And I didn't always meet them. But the thing is, guys, like, like one thing we need to understand is that there are, there are always going to be unintended consequences of teaching this fantasy that everything in our law system, everything in our country, everything in the air we breathe is racist and white supremacist. And you might not believe that, by the way. You might be thinking, yeah, I don't believe that. But the reality is that the, the documents that you're using to teach your black son about white privilege and allyship and stuff like that – this all comes from that ideology. Everything about that stuff that you're using, these documents, these books, these, you know, white fragility, all this stuff, it's tainted. It's poison. It is intended to turn the races against each other. If you want your black or brown son or daughter to grow up hating you, Start teaching them about white supremacy and white privilege and allyship and anti-racism and all that stuff because those documents will drive your son and daughter to, 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 to treat you with contempt because there's nothing you can do right when you are uh, on the white privilege side, the white supremacist side. There's nothing you can do right. 
Oh, you're speaking about racism? Oh, it's all about you, isn't it, Whitey? Well, why don't you yield some space and let us handle this? Oh, you're not speaking anymore? Well, white silence is white violence, so you're you're still wrong, Whitey. You got you don't understand. You need to really look at the stuff that you're feeding your children. Have you ever heard anything like white privilege in the scripture? Have you heard anything like this allyship and this anti-racism stuff and this white privilege and white supremacy? Have you heard any of this stuff and whiteness is wicked? Have you ever heard any of this stuff in the scripture? Well, the truth is you have, and it's always denounced. Don't teach your son that, man. Don't teach your daughter that, man. I'm begging you. They are going to grow up with a victim complex and an inferiority complex that's going to be very difficult to dismantle as a ch- as an adult. If you want to hurt your children, start buying into this woke stuff. I'm telling you, it's no good. It's no good. Don't ever let the mob and the crowd guilt you into teaching your son or daughter something that is not biblical. It will destroy them. It will destroy them. Because the reality is you hit what you aim for. Here's another example. Let's take it out of the adoption uh, 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 example for a second because that's very emotional. This is your daughter. This is your son. And I'm telling you, if you teach them about this allyship, white privilege, white supremacy stuff, you're going to ruin them. I'm not going to mince words here. You're going to ruin them. A few might escape, but most of them won't. Let me give it a different example. Here's another example of unintended consequences. Uh, Tim Keller the other day or not the other day, a few years ago, gave a speech about white privilege and systemic racism. And in it, he said, here's a good example of systemic racism. He said, um, someone did a study and found out that uh, uh, black women end up paying more for their cars because they're, you know, during the haggling process, they're not as good at negotiating, right? They're not as good at negotiating a, a price as white males. So, so they were actually being punished for being black women Um, because of the haggling process. And and Tim Keller said that that's an unjust systemic problem. And he said that the only solution for a Christian, this is what he said, I'm not making this up. He said, because uh, if you're a Christian and you run a car store, the only solution is to eliminate haggling so that everyone pays the same price. Okay, So, so, so a couple problems with that, right? Because that might sound pretty good to people. And of course, if you're a business owner, you can do whatever you want. I'm not saying you can't do that. If you want to do that, you can do that. But there's an unintended consequence from what Tim Keller is suggesting. Because here's the reality. That might work for one or two car dealerships. But the problem is that the unintended consequence is that the black women never actually learn how to negotiate. You know what I mean? They never actually learn how to negotiate. And so what ends up happening is when you go back into the real world where someone wants to haggle price with you, you don't have the skill set to pay what you should be paying and you're going to get pay, you're going to end up paying more a better idea instead of instead of instead of trying to make everything even stevens which is not a biblical concept by the way instead of doing that and acting like well black women because this is the thing tim keller is is implicitly saying he would never say this directly but he's implicitly saying that black women are just incapable of negotiating as well as a white man and i don't believe that don't teach your kid that my goodness, don't teach your black or brown kid that they're not as capable as white people. Because when you teach white supremacy and white privilege and all this stuff and allyship and you can't, you won't be able to amount to anything unless I use my white privilege to help you. Like, if you teach your son that, he's going to learn that. I don't believe that, man. I'm getting a little he- emotional here because it's so, it's so damaging to minorities, man. It's so damaging, this idea of white supremacy and white privilege and, and allyship. And I think you would see it if, if, if it was outside of this context. Because I don't believe black women are incapable of negotiating. I think a better idea would be to teach them to negotiate, teach them to walk away if the price isn't right, teach them to negotiate better, and then not only will they get the cars at a better rate, but they can take that life skill with them for the rest of their lives and take that and negotiate better salaries and negotiate better prices on home deliveries of things and negotiate better rates for daycare, whatever it is, whatever they need. You see, the unintended consequence of saying, well, black women can't negotiate as well as white women, so I guess we should make all the prices the same. The unintended consequence there is that black women never 
are challenged enough to step up their game. That's the reality. I saw another guy, Philip Holmes. He's a blue check mark, Big Eva type. And he said, white people, if you ask a black person for help on racial issues, want to pick their brain, you better offer to pay for them because their time is valuable. And I retweeted it. I said, here's a better idea. Teach the black people to respect their time enough to ask for money if they feel like they're valuable enough to do that. Because that'll not only will it yield better results now, but it'll also that's a skill they can take with them for the rest of their life. So yeah, someone people offer to pay, to pay me all the time. I don't have a problem with white people offering to pay black people. But a better idea instead of trying to guilt white people into giving you cash, a better idea is to learn how to freaking ask for it. Ask for cash if you're providing value and you think that value is is is, is worth that, that what you're providing is worth money. Ask for money. Someone reaches out to you and say, hey, man, I'd really like to, to, to take an hour of your time to talk about you know this or that. And you say, great, I'd love to do that. I mean, in fact, that's actually a business of mine, $50 an hour. You see, you can't be ashamed of that kind of stuff. And, and the thing is, like, if you are ashamed of that kind of stuff to ask for money, then you need to learn how to not be. <laughs> that's an essential life skill. Economics is an essential life skill. And so when you teach people that well just give them cash because it's this guy actually said that it was it was a guilt trip to 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 expect blacks to ask for money for value that they provide that's that's an insane way to look at the world that's insane that's not a guilt trip that should that's 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 being a human right economic activity is part of being a human so if you provide value you should ask for for money in return right and, and sometimes you can do something for free. I do things for free all the time because I know that that could lead to paid business in the future. You know what I mean? So sometimes you do offer stuff for free. I do this on I do, I, you know, I do this all the time. Most of my content is available for free. I ask for support, but most of my content is available for free because I want it out there. But you got to Christians, we have to think of unintended consequences. I'm begging you. I'm begging you. If you have an adopted black or brown child or Asian child or whatever. Do not teach them this woke stuff. This is poison for their soul. Poison for their soul. I have an entire YouTube channel explaining why it's poison for their soul. They will start to resent people. They will start to feel like they want revenge. They will start to um, look at you as a, as other, as the enemy and stuff like that. I'm, I'm, I'm begging you. I'm begging you. I've, I've lived this, man. My father was not a perfect man, but he did a great job with me. You don't have to ignore racism. But this stuff, white supremacy, white privilege, you know, um, we need to, I need to check my privilege. I need to use my privilege to lift you up. That's poison, my friends. That's poison. You will destroy your child if you buy into this stuff and teach them this stuff. I'm not going to mince words with you. If you teach your black or brown child this woke church stuff, you will destroy them. I'm sorry for I'm sorry for how heavy this has to be. But Christians need to think about the unintended consequences of not following the scripture. The scripture provides you all you need to raise your children. You don't need the Robert D'Angelo book, White Supremacy or White Fragility. You don't need Color of Compromise. You don't need Woke Church. All of that stuff. I talk about it in my videos all day long. You want to see why it's garbage? I'll show you why it's garbage. I'm begging you. Don't destroy your children. Don't destroy your children because you are being made to feel guilty. Just because somebody calls you a white supremacist or a racist doesn't make it true. Anyway. I hope you found this podcast and video helpful. Please, if you're an adoptive parent and you want help on resources and stuff like that, I won't charge you. <laughs> I won't charge you. But I, I, I want to help. And uh, I'm not going to be the person that's going to be able to help you with all that stuff, but I can point you in the right direction. Please, I'm begging you, don't teach them this stuff. I hope this, this podcast was helpful. God bless. <music> Don't forget to tune in next week on Thursday for AD on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network.